God has a word to say to us through our pulpit guest. And I have already made him an honorary member of the Second Baptist family. And even though he lives in New York, he is really at heart a Texan. Welcome, Eric Metaxas. <laughs> I, is this happening? Is this real? Um, you know my first question. Why is anybody seated back there? That's my first question. I don't understand that. Uh, I, uh, I'm not going to try. I have so much I want to say. I am so blessed to be here. If uh, someone that you revere as much as I revere Ed Young, says those things about you, the only logical thing to do is slink away quickly because it can only go downhill. I can't possibly live up to what he just said, but I am so grateful for it. Um, there's only one correction uh, th that I can make. I love it. This is my love language. If I correct you or, or make fun of you publicly, that's how you know I love you. <laughs> Pastor Young said he referred to something, what was it, Socrates in New York, right? Not only is that not true, it's Socrates in the city. This is, listen to why I'm saying this. Because this fall, we're doing Socrates in the city. We usually do it in New York, but we're doing one in Houston. Yeah. So I'm glad it's not Socrates in New York because I get to come back here. Uh, that'll be October 12th. Um, but we, we're, we do them around the country once in a while, and I am going to be back here for that and, and some other things. So... Um, in any event, I'm here to speak to you on a pretty heavy subject. I have a book coming out soon. It's called Letter to the American Church. And you kind of think, who would be arrogant enough to dare write a book with the title Letter to the American Church? Well, um, if you have any wisdom, you know that if you're going to take a title like that, you, you better get it right. You better allow the Lord to speak through you because uh, it's not just something that I have to say. It's something that I say with deepest humility that I believe the Lord wanted me to write, to speak to his church. Um, and it is, it's, it is very heavy. But as you know, the heavier the message from the Lord, the more glory on the other side. That's the nature of this exquisite God that we name the God of the scripture. He is beyond anything we can imagine and we can never, ever outgive him. He is a God of grace. We say that over and over and over. Do we even begin to understand what that means? The graciousness, the love of God, it's effectively incomprehensible for us because we're broken sinners. Apart from him, we can't even glimpse who he is. Um, my most recent book before the book that I'm talking about right now is called Is Atheism Dead? And it's pure apologetics. And it is very encouraging because I, I think sometimes, you know, if I'm going to deliver what's a, sort of a heavy message or a serious message, I want to encourage you that the Lord in these last days, as things fall apart, the Lord is encouraging us in the middle of it to, uh, to draw closer to him uh, because he wants to show us things that he could not show us unless things kind of got bad first to wake up those who are yet sleeping. If you are yet sleeping, would you raise your hand? Okay, that's good. You weren't supposed to raise your hand. That was a trick question. All right, so then you're awake. Now I'm really scared. I was hoping half of you would be sleeping. Um, but the message the Lord gave me to speak in this book, Letter to the American Church, is not, um, you see, I see people coming in late and it's always friends of mine. You see that guy there? But I praise the Lord because he is so backslidden, I didn't think he was going to show up. <laughs> that, is, uh, that is my former friend, Seth Ward, showing up late with his family. I can't believe it. He's a wounded man. Pray for that guy. Um, you see my love language? Do you see? That's how you know I love that guy. I 
called him out. I'm so happy he came up late. Um, uh, I was, uh, I, I gotta be honest with you, um, where we are as a nation right now, you don't need to be politically tuned in to understand that we are at an unprecedentedly horrible moment. But because the word of God says, all things work together for good, for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Now you think about that, all things. Why does the scripture say all things? Because the Lord knows it is our nature to say, well, not that and that and that and that. And the Lord says, I knew you were gonna say that. That's why I had my servant Paul write, all things, every horror, every injustice, every corrupt politician, every liar, every dark thing that happens, if you love me and are called according to my purposes, those things will work together for good for you. We need that word today, folks, because things are bad, but the Lord says, well, sometimes I let things get bad to wake you up or to wake up those who are not yet awake. When we talk about the grace of God, part of the reason I wrote this book is because of the book that I wrote on Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, wrote about the concept of cheap grace. Some of you are familiar with that in his book, Cost of Discipleship. He, he wrote about cheap grace, and basically what he was saying to the German church in the 30s, and the reason I wrote this book, Letter to the American Church, is because the parallels of the American church today to the German church in the 30s are astonishing. They are incontrovertible. They are clear that as the church in Germany was silent in the 30s and allowed satanic evil to take over, so the church in America today is silent and is now allowing satanic evil to take over. That's a fact. Now the question is, the question is, when Bonhoeffer spoke, his prophetic message fell on deaf ears and the German church remained silent and hell on earth was unleashed. The question is, will what Bonhoeffer had to say then be heard by the American church now? And will we avert the horror that we deserve for our silence? Will we speak up now before it's too late? It is almost too late, but I believe the Lord gave me this message in this book because I believe it is his will that the American church, the remnant, the actual church, not the quote unquote church, the remnant, the holy remnant, the saints of God willing to die for Jesus because we believe he defeated death on the cross and we know we can never die, that that church would wake up and would arise at this time because I believe the Lord has a plan for this nation. When we talk about American exceptionalism, we don't mean America is better than other countries, okay, that we're better, but that the ideas of liberty and self-government, which ultimately, and I write about this in my Luther book, come out of the scripture. These ideas of self-government and liberty that we have enjoyed in this nation come out of the scriptures. We don't deserve to live in a free country, but the Lord has given us this outrageous blessing for his purposes in history. And if we live freely, and if we hold up the torch of freedom, the gospel is preached more, people around the world are blessed. So the Lord, when the Lord chooses you, because we know Lincoln called America God's almost chosen people. He has a special plan. If the Lord chooses you and has a special plan for you, you better watch out. You better watch out. You don't want the Lord to choose you. You don't say, pick me, Lord. Because if he chooses you, you've been given a holy burden that others do not have. Israel was chosen by God, and Israel went through hell over the millennia. It is not a fun thing to be chosen by God, but it is a holy and a beautiful thing. And in many ways... The Lord has chosen America for his purposes. Whomever the Lord chooses for his purposes, 
need to understand it is a holy burden from God. And I believe the Lord is not finished with us, that he wants to speak to us now that we would avert the disaster. But Bonhoeffer saw this happening in Germany, and he spoke out against this. He wrote about it. And the central idea of why the German church was silent, the same reason the American church today is being silent, was bad theology, right? Now, when we say bad theology, we say, well, your theology is bad. That's, that's bad theology. Bad theology comes from one place and one place alone. That is the pit of hell. So it's not kind of like, well, bad theology, you get a B minus. It's from the pit of hell designed to confuse the people of God into doing or not doing what God would have them to do. And Bonhoeffer was trying to speak to the church in Germany in the 30s. And some of you have heard the quote, I don't think he actually said it, but it's attributed to him, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. You wanna play it safe? You wanna keep your mouth shut? You don't wanna get in trouble? God declares that as evil. Evil to be silent when you need to speak up, when God has appointed you to speak up, when God died on the cross for you to be free, to have no fear of man, but to speak the truth in all circumstances knowing God has your back. Well, Bonhoeffer <laughs> saw that the church in Germany was soft. And where did that bad theology come from? He writes about it in Cost of Discipleship. I write about it in my new book, Letter to the American Church. Where does it come from? You know, bad ideas always come from good ideas that get twisted. So we know in the story of Luther, Luther, you know, 500 years ago, saw a church consumed with works, concerned with you need to do this and this and this and this, and you can earn your way to heaven and so on and so forth. And Luther said, no, 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 no. It is by faith alone in Jesus and what he did on the cross. It is by faith that you're saved, okay? Well, Bonhoeffer saw that 400-something years later, the Germans had gotten that idea so much that they misunderstood it. They kind of thought, I don't need to do anything. I just need to quote unquote have faith. But what does James say in his epistle? He says, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. In other words, first of all, well, two points. Number one, you're saved by faith in Jesus, okay? You're saved by faith in, in Jesus. So it's not what you do. You can't earn your way to faith. But it has to be real faith. <laughs> it can't be fake faith. You can't say, well, I, I, I believe that when in your heart you don't, when you don't behave as though you believe it because faith is proved by works. The, the devil knows if you believe because he just looks at your life. Are you sleeping with someone you're not married to? Well, that's an easy one. There's all kinds of ways your friends, your enemies, and the devil and the Lord can just look at your life and know if you actually believe. And if you actually believe, you're saved by faith. But the Lord is not fooled by cheap faith or fake faith. Cheap grace is not grace. In other words, if you appreciate the grace of God, if you say, I believe, you, you realize that what Jesus did on the cross for you is just so unspeakable that it changes everything about how you live your life. So you can't just make an intellectual assent like, yes, I believe that, and then carry on with your life. If you actually believe that, you will behave differently. You will not be fearful of sharing your faith with others, now you, you don't need to become a religious blabbermouth because that's a different kind of trouble. But the point is that if you really believe Jesus died for you on the cross and that he shed his grace for you, if you get that, it can never stop at intellectual assent. You can't say, well, if you wanna know what I believe, it's all by faith, it's all by what I believe, and go to the website of my church and there's a statement of faith, that's what I believe. The demons are not fooled by that. That is a fig leaf. No one is fooled. Your life is a picture of what you believe. How you live 
And what you say and what you don't say is a clear picture of what you actually believe. And so Bonhoeffer was trying to wake up the German church at the time because they got so stuck on this Lutheran idea that it's faith alone, faith alone, faith alone. And he says, well, yes, but it has to be actual faith. It can't be faith because you say I believe because your behavior shows what you believe. So are you living in a way that shows that you actually believe these things? Because if you actually believe, you are saved by that faith. But if you're living your life in a way that doesn't show evidence that you actually believe these things, then you are actually damned. You are not saved. And he was trying to wake up the German church and to say, many of you think you're saved because you believe intellectually. And he says, but God's not interested in that. Faith without works is dead. And God says this as a warning to us because he loves us. He does not want us to be separated from him from eternity. He wants us to live our lives from the moment we actually believe, he wants us to live our lives differently. Now that's gonna look different in everybody's life. We're not called to live the same. We're not, none of us called to be a religious fanatic, an annoying person. But every single one of us, if you believe what the scripture says, what Jesus did for you, you are going to live your whole life differently. You're not gonna be silent in the face of evil. You're gonna speak up when you see something wrong because you're not afraid, because you know Jesus actually defeated death on the cross. That's not a metaphor. He actually defeated death on the cross. So you don't fear death if you actually believe. Bonhoeffer gave a sermon in 1932 about two or so months before Hitler came to power. And it was in an august church in Berlin. It was like the church, you know, where... The, the big shots would show up in that church, in that culture. Hindenburg would show up. It was just a, that was the place. Boy, if you got to speak in that pulpit. And he spoke there on Reformation Day, 1932. Reformation Day was the day that they celebrate the Reformation and Luther and all that good stuff, right? And Bonhoeffer could see they were not celebrating Jesus they were celebrating themselves. They were celebrating Luther, who is German, and we're German, and we're Lutherans, and we're, we're all about the Reformation, and they were sort of celebrating themselves. They had forgotten the first love. They had forgotten that Luther faced death for what he proclaimed. How many of them in those comfortable pews would ever face death, or if they did face death, would face death? or would simply say, what do I need to say so you'll leave me alone? Bonhoeffer knew, as he spoke in 1932, that the German church of Luther was essentially dead, or almost dead, and he wanted to wake them up. Why? Because he saw satanic evil taking over the nation. And he said, if the church will be the church and live as though it believes Jesus has defeated death. We'll live freely and we'll speak boldly. The satanic evil of the Third Reich, which took over that nation, would never have been able to do that. Now, that is a fact. In, in 1939 or 40, he was writing to a friend and he wrote about religionless Christianity. He said, we've been merely religious. We've been going to church, going through the motions. If we had actually lived as Christians, not as religious people, but as 24-7, full-throated Christians with no fear of man, with no fear of anything but God and love for God, none of these wicked things would have been able to happen, but we, the church, let it happen. Bonhoeffer, in 1932 and the years after, was trying to say to the church, the church is the conscience of the state. If the church doesn't speak up, the, God will judge the church infinitely more than he will judge the, judge the non-believers because the church has no excuse for its silence. The church says we believe Jesus defeated death on the cross. We say that. If we will live like that and live freely and speak to whatever issue there is, God will be with us. But if we do not, if the church ceases to be the church, 
then the nation is naked and alone and will drift along with the devil's purposes. And that happened in Germany. Now, my mother grew up in Germany during that time. Uh, I know many people who were there. Most of us in America, you know, unless you grew up in a place like Cuba or former Soviet bloc, or unless you've really seen that stuff, you have probably been lulled into the idea that, you know, things are just getting better and everything's okay. We're never gonna have to face anything like that. Well, the Lord in his mercy has allowed us to live through the last two plus years to show us that, you know what? There's nothing new. Evil is just as real and evil is crouching at the door and evil will destroy you and your nation as quickly as it destroyed Germany unless you repent, unless you will stand in the way the German church failed to stand. And he has given us an example of the German church and how they didn't heed what Bonhoeffer was saying for our sake to say, Bonhoeffer is now speaking to you. You have the example of what happened when the church was silent. Will you take it seriously? They did not and you saw what happened. It is a horrifying thing when the church is quiet. And Bonhoeffer tried to get them to say that the grace that we're singing about and talking about is cheap grace. If you do not live your life as though these things are true, you mock the death of Jesus on the cross. If you understand what he did for you, you give your whole life as a way of paying it back, as saying, Lord, out of gratitude for what you did for me, I'm gonna live my life completely differently. I'm not gonna live like the world because I believe what you did for me. And I will be a shining symbol to all those who don't believe that God changes lives. So when people look at your life, do they see you living that way? Does the devil fear you because you're living for Christ? Or have we in the American church, so many of us, been lulled into silence thinking bad things have happened in the past. Yeah, maybe the church in Ephesus can get judged and maybe the German church maybe could get judged. But we are, we're past that. We're in America. Everything's fine. The Lord's allowed these things to happen to us fairly recently to let us know that unless we stand and unless we live self-sacrificially for him, we are already going in that direction. We have no idea what can be unleashed on us. What the Nazis had planned for the world was pretty evil, but what globalist atheist elites have planned for the world is as evil or more evil than what Bonhoeffer planned. Why do you think we would be exempt? We think that, yeah, we fought World War II and we're done? We're in a spiritual battle every minute we're on this side of the veil. And if you're, if you're not dead, you're on this side of the veil. You're in a spiritual battle. And the Lord calls you to that battle. He has armed you for the battle. But he can't force you to fight and to love him with your whole heart and mind and soul. Now, think of this. That's Jesus' commandment to the church, right? He didn't say, be good, be nice, don't be political, when the young man asks him, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul. Th think of this, folks. We are being commanded by Jesus to love him with our whole heart and mind and soul. Not just to obey him or to stay out of trouble or to be good. To love the Lord, to live your life as though you love him and if you don't love him and live your life as though you love him, you disobey him. That's the commandment from Jesus' mouth, to love him. In Germany, at the beginning of the 1930s, there were 18,000 Protestant pastors. A few of them woke up early on and wrote this thing called the Barman Declaration where they said, we will not bow to the secular authority of the state. They saw the Nazis trying to take over the church, trying to silence the church, and they wrote the Barman Declaration, and maybe 6,000 of these 18,000 pastors 
signed the Barman Declaration and said, we will bow before no one but the holy God of Scripture, before no one but Jesus. That was a brave thing. But again, if you actually believe Jesus defeated death on the cross, it's not that brave. It's just realistic. Because guess what? He actually did defeat death on the cross. It's not just a happy religious thought, is it? It's true. If you actually believe that, in Germany at that time, you signed the Barman Declaration. But by 1935, so about two years after the Barman Declaration, only about 3,000 of the 18,000 pastors were standing strongly against the state trying to take over. Now remember, it's the, as much as it's the job of the church to be the conscience of the state, it's the job of the state to try to mess with the church. It's the job of the state in places like China to crush the church. That's what the state does. That's why in America we have this thing called separation of church and state because we say we, if we don't have that, we know what the state wants to do. We know that the culture is at war with the Lord and his purposes. So we have had a wonderful tradition, separation of church and state in America. They didn't have that in Germany. And so the, the German state under the Nazis, now no longer under Kaiser, who was a Christian, right? They start to encroach and crush. So the Germans write the Barman Declaration, but they had so persecuted the Christians willing to open up their mouths that by 1935, only 3,000 of those 18,000 were still standing strong. Because you could lose your job, you could lose your congregation, you might be sent to a concentration camp. My question to you is, what price have you paid for speaking up? Have you paid a price? I paid a little price. My radio TV program was wiped off of YouTube because I say such dangerous things that they had to wipe the program off. That's been happening all across America, right? Where you see people being picked off, right? The 3,000 were willing to stand strong. On the other side of those 18,000 was another 3,000 that were totally pro-Hitler, couldn't care less about the Church of Jesus Christ, even though they were pastors. There are churches like that today. They just sold their soul to the devil, and whether they're, you know, preaching the rainbow flag or the BLM flag, or whether they're basically saying, we'll say whatever we need to say, you know, to be, to go along with the culture. Tell us whatever you want us to say. We'll do whatever you want us to say. They, in Germany, there were 3,000 pastors of the 18,000 on that side of the, the aisle. And there were 3,000 that stood firm in 1935 on this side. But my question, and it's a title of a chapter in my book, Letter to the American Church, it's 12,000 pastors. There were 12,000 pastors in the middle who were not willing to commit who were not willing to say anything. They wanted to stand on the sidelines. Let those other 3,000 hotheads get canceled. Let them take the heat. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna stand back here and quote unquote preach the gospel. What dead gospel do you think you're preaching? If you are afraid to speak the truth of God for his purposes in history, what False gospel, do you think you're being allowed to preach? If you cannot speak the truth about what a man is and what a woman is, about what marriage is, about the idea that CRT is cultural Marxism and atheism designed to divide the races and destroy the nation, if you are silent about those things, you're being silent in the face of evil. And you're not fooling God. Those 12,000 pastors, in their silence, in their deciding to say, we're going we're gonna to step back and let those other guys fight it out, they allowed the Holocaust and satanic evil to take over Germany. And I hope you understand God judges that. Because those who suffered the horrors of the damned in the Holocaust and beyond, God loved those people. And those who claimed to be Christians and were silent in the face of evil broke God's heart, and God's judgment is on them. 
So the question is, in our day, when we have a very similar situation, just a handful who are willing to take the heat, my exhortation to my brothers and sisters in Christ, especially in pulpits across America, is will you wake up now and avert the judgment that is sure to come, that is already coming now? Will you stand up? Will you speak? Will you tell those who try to shut you up and say, don't be political, don't speak about this or this or this or this, will you tell them to shut up? Will you tell them, God rebuke you for trying to silence me from speaking the truth of God for his purposes in history? When people tell you you can't talk about this or can't talk about that, you don't even have to agree with me. We don't even have to agree with each other, right? When people say, you can't talk about the vaccine, you can't talk about the election, whether it was stolen, I want to say, excuse me, we don't have to agree. But how dare you tell me that I can't speak about something? Once you tell me, <laughs> once you tell me that I can't speak about something, I know you don't care about the truth. I know you're the enemy of truth because truth invites conversation and dialogue and says, let us reason together. When you try to cancel me, I know you are of your father, the devil. Yeah. Bonhoeffer said the church is the conscience of the state. The Lord has chosen his church to be the conscience of the state. The church of Jesus Christ in America today is the conscience of the state. If the church is silent, America will go down and is now going down unless the church arise and speak fearlessly as the church in Germany certainly did not. Folks, I think we've all seen enough to understand how bad things can get, how quickly things can go south and fall apart, and how quickly a globalist, atheist worldview can be imposed on us if we let it. But the Lord invites us. This is not a guilt trip. Think of this, folks. The Lord says, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not inviting you into a battle that you don't really want to fight. I'm inviting you into a battle where I, the Lord of hosts, lift up the battle standard and you get by my grace to stand with me in a battle of good versus evil. You get to be part of my church, my redeemed ones, my saints, to participate in the most glorious thing imaginable. You don't want to miss that. You do not want to miss that. You want to look for every opportunity you can to live out your faith, to speak the truth in love with no fear, knowing that the Lord has appointed you as a voice for the voiceless. So the question is simply, do you believe? Do you have faith? If you believe in Jesus, you are saved and you'll be with him in heaven forever. But if in your silence you prove that you don't know what you think and you're pretty sure you don't want to risk your life, you declare that you don't believe these things. Folks, the Lord has allowed these bad things to happen to force us in his mercy to decide and to choose and to say, do not miss this opportunity to serve the Lord Jesus now. The time is now. It is not a mistake that you're alive now. The Lord appointed you now to be his people in this season for his eternal purposes. And if you will risk everything, you can never outgive God. God will bless you in unimaginable ways. Even if you are murdered, as Bonhoeffer was murdered, you will step into unimaginable glory in paradise. These things are true. 
And the Lord wants us to know these things, not to hope that these things are true. Not to hope, to know that these things are true and that he has done all he can, including rise from the dead, to show that these things are true, to exhort us who are timid to say, do not be timid. Step out of the boat. Know that I am with you wherever you go and that I will use you to bring glory to my name and what you do will redound to bless innumerable people in this nation and through this nation around the world for my purposes. Revival will come, but my church must arise and stand and live for me with no fear, knowing that I stand with them. Father God, Lord, we lift our hearts to you. Lord, we are unworthy to stand with you. We are unworthy to know who you are. But you, in your grace, have allowed us a glimpse of who you are that we could participate with you in what you are doing in history this minute, in this nation, to touch the world. Father, fill us with faith. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that no part of us would hang back from the glorious exploits to which you call us now and which you created us for. In Jesus' name, hallelujah.